So just to introduce you, uh, who is uh, Gilles? So uh, Gilles Berto uh, has been creating uh, Livestorm. It's an all-in-one uh, platform for video communication. He's a first-time entrepreneur. Actually, he jumped right after uh, his school into uh, entrepreneurship. He co-founded uh, Livestorm in 2016. Uh, in November 2020, so really recently, he raised 30 million in a Series B funding to strengthen Lifestorm presence in the US and introduce new video use cases. So today, more than 3,500 companies trust Lifestorm to organize their meeting, their webinars, and their online events. I'm super excited to welcome uh, Gilles. Uh, today and we will have 30 minutes. Hello, Gilles. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Cool. I'm super happy to, to have you here. So are we in your office or are, are we at your home? No, no. That, I, I wish I was my home, but no, it's my office. I, I, I did a slight discussion here, uh, transgression and come to the office because internet is better and, you know, it's actually nicer in terms of environment. Yeah, it's cool. Is that a fridge behind? Yeah, that's actually one of the first fridge that we bought on the first offices. It has pretty much all the stickers from every tech French startups out there, even some US ones. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, Gilles, let, let's start with the beginning. Can you give me like one sentence to explain the way you do it, uh, Lifestorm? Sure. So Livestorm is a video communication platform. It enables you to run meetings and webinars right from your browser, whether that's a mobile browser or a desktop browser from one to 1,000 attendees. And uh, we run end-to-end -end logistics. So we don't just care about the video itself, but we care about landing pages, retargeting, promotion, everything else around. Basically, we want to do the heavy lifting so we can really focus on whatever content you need to create for your organizations. Hmm. Back in 2016, when you started, you didn't know that overnight the world would switch uh, to a remote work, right? So w w where did the idea come from? Uh, did the idea come from at the very beginning? What made you so <laughs> passionate about this? Uh, well, you know, when we when we first started, so it's I mean it's a funny story. We, I, I was just an intern at the time. I was working at uh, Mention that you may know here in Paris, and you know, actually I was doing a bunch of webinars for them. And uh, the customers that we had had the same same struggles that the prospect that we have today. So essentially, I was teaching them on how to download something on the computer just to attend the event. I was coding the landing pages, coding the emails, because the defaults from the software were not getting it. And also from a data standpoint, I didn't get much out of it. So not only I was spending a lot of time organizing the event, um, you know, teaching people on how to use a product, but also I was not getting much ROI out of it. So, you know, uh, we were fresh out of college. We actually, no, actually we were still in college. <laughs> and I was uh, required to build this, um, you know, final exam project, business plan, whatever. You know, it was like really like a dummy startup that we need to build. And so this is how we got the idea. And we built this, you know, slight proof of concept, browser base, landing page builders, small integration, you know, really small proof of concept. And we presented that to the jury. And not only we presented it, but we stream our own presentation. And then we ended up actually stream streaming entire all the other teams' presentations. We stayed a whole day streaming, people coming on the chat. We had like 100 people coming in, even our bosses you know, from the internships came. So for the first time, we had this feeling that, you know what, we actually build something like people enjoy to use. So that's that's pretty cool. Maybe there is something there. you know. And when we graduated, we said it was not so much of a different lifestyle going from you know, intern to unemployed. So you know, let's just roll with it and see what happens. <laughs> and by the way, I think you come from a, a, a school that is called ethics that I really right. love because they, they mix different kinds of backgrounds and people, designers with tech people. It's a very different approach to uh, uh, education, right? Right. Yes. It's a really like project-based approach and uh, it 
it basically produces jack of all trades. So I have a CTO who've done design classes and marketing classes. My other associate is, you know, CPO, so in charge of product. He's been doing some tech classes and code and myself as well. I mean, the first website of Livestorm, I coded it, you know, from scratch. So it was it was really nice to not be to not have that struggle of finding a co-founder that is technical because we're all technical, we're all jack of all trades. And that was actually one of the first brick of the culture that we put in place when I, you know, take a look back, I think. Exactly. And we can feel it actually. Maybe you could describe a little bit before we jump into the growth and how you've been hiring people, what kind of people you're looking for. Maybe we could start by defining what is your culture and yeah, let, let's start with this question. <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, to be really transparent, I mean, don't don't worry too much. We've been like really bad at it, really bad at defining it. It has been this kind of underlying thing, unconscious thing that we knew we had to respect, but we didn't like put it on the wall. We didn't really put words on it. It was we were trusting our guts, but at some point when you start you know, being 10, 20, you actually need to put that on paper mm -hmm. at some point because you need people to, actually you need to delegate hiring and to make sure they hire the same type of profiles that you look for, then, you know, you have to put some words on it. So we take a look, It, I mean, you know, it took us like maybe one or two years, no, actually one year and a half something to, you know, really uh, make that concise and put it on paper. Yeah. So essentially the first thing that we look for is, so there is this jack of all trade thing being we call that being resourceful you know and being yeah. sure that you you you're resourceful you're autonomous and you'll be able to dig into problems and not be you know limited by the scope of your job and try to you know expand beyond that uh the second thing is being curious we we feel that conversations and ideas do not come from necessarily from the same people over and over again the, best product ideas that we had didn't come from product, they come from sales, they come from care, they come from even ops people. So that's one thing that we look for, people interested in the business as a whole, as this jack of all trend mindset, that's one of the other thing. I mean, the the idea that I like to, the, sorry, the example that I like to bring usually is the, 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 the person that is actually leading the US team right now on the care team is, she actually was uh, taking care of children here in Paris before when we hired her. She was American, living in Paris, taking care of children. And now we, we hired her because she had this account manager background uh, before in the US, but she wasn't doing that in Paris. And now she's probably the most technical person on a care team right now. And wow. that, that's just an impressive learning curve. And that's one of the things we look for. Um, and I think the last, bit that is really, really important for us is humility. We try to find people that are uh, simple, that do things, really low profiles, you know, huge performers, but really low profile. Uh, and we actually disqualified a lot of great candidates on paper from a skill set standpoint, but was not there yet in terms of ego. And we feel that when you can put some ego on the side, you know, conversations are suddenly way more open, transparent, and easier, actually. Mm -hmm. I get it. So how it's been uh, this year for you? Because suddenly many, many, many users started uh, uh, using Lifestorm. Right? Yeah. So, you know, we were fresh out of Series A. So we had a Series A like back in June. It was a 4.6 million euros. And we were like 30 starting 2020. And then we had the whole, you know, business plan plan out. We had like uh, a thousand ish customers and we were mm. on, our, on our way to to make what are all two two X the growth that we had uh, that we wanted to have this year. And when we enter March, which is usually a good month, starts things to accelerate. You know, lockdown begins, things start to accelerate and we don't really, you know, uh, I think we think it's kind of normal, right? Because March is always like a good month, but you know, then you start refreshing your dashboard. And then every time you refresh, you see the numbers go up, you know, you're like, no, this is not normal at all. <laughs> there is something going on here. And to give you an idea between beginning of March and end of May, we tripled the AR, which, you know, is pretty good growth <laughs> from a series A company. And we fear that, 
you know, after the lockdown. So back in May, uh, we we will lose those people. That momentum, momentum will cease because you know lockdown is over. People will not need Livestone anymore. And it turns out it was quite the opposite, actually. And now it's September, we are back at, back at it again. And now we are pretty much on a track of making an 8x growth in one single year, which you know is not something you see every day. And that's pretty insane to handle. Yeah. Tomorrow. And in terms of use case, tell me, because you, you, you're not just a tool for events like the one we are uh, uh, doing today. You are a tool also for internal communication. So you've seen the, 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 sorry, the inside of and the adaptation of the startup uh, internally. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so basically, if you take, you know, the, the, the web conferencing market is a really large market. It's a lot of noise, a lot of different products. There is one popping up every single week. And I think it happened, typically, the one we're using now, it's really on the end of the spectrum in terms of complexity. You have to large scale events, punctual events that happens one, twice, you know, a year or something. For us, we're more on the middle of the spectrum. We take care of your regular video communications that you do on a daily or weekly basis. So from meetings to webinars to you know that kind of complexity that that, that, you, that you require. And and you know actually it doesn't matter if it is internal or external. We have people doing like internal trainings, internal onboardings, t um, town hall meetings using Livestorm. And we also have on the other end people doing product demos, one-to-one -one product demos, but also one-to-many product demos. So it's quite different. But I think the the common thing is that is those use cases that you have every day within your organization is the stuff that we address and we address it really well as a uh, um, uh, as a differentiator from zoom for example because we have this whole logistic around the streaming we we feel that video is a commodity is not something we should focus anymore we should focus about the packaging of the video just like hubspot did for landing pages or emails or whatever we feel that the packaging is what's going to make video different now. Mm. And have you seen, I'm just curious, have you seen interesting um, ways of doing things uh, uh, for companies adapting uh, to the remote world? Yeah, so we've seen a lot mm. of cool things, actually. We've seen, I think COVID actually has accelerated a lot of different um, uh, new use cases i think you know this pre on, on a pre covid world the the webinar was mostly for example, if you take webinars a use case it was mostly attached semantically to the traditional you know marketing webinars let's you know talk about whatever content whatever industry etc but when covid happens you know everyone was kind to forced to start using video for whatever they had to do so continuing the business and then from there people realized that you know, there is this huge gap between B2C and B2B. Hosting a live on a B2C space, it's so easy. You grab your phone, you go Instagram live, boom, out of a sudden you have a hundred people, you know, engaging with you. On a B2B world, it's so hard. And for some reason, you know, there is this huge gap and we want to actually close that gap. That's our job, our mission is Livestorm. And people started, you know, start get creative about the content. So we've seen banks, like literally like big, huge banks that don't, care about remote, don't used to care about remote, starting doing internal podcasting, um, uh, board meetings using Livestorm, showcase some R&D projects and stuff. So that's just not something you used to see like a year ago. And I think one of the coolest use cases that we've seen is actually institutions. So the NHS in the UK, European commissions, um, also the French governments starting using Livestorm to coordinate themselves, coordinate actions during COVID. That was so insane to see. It's far from the marketing use case. And they're still using Livestorm because, you know, it has all, they can create some kind of coordination and have the control of the communication and look professional. And it, it's so easy for them because it's in a browser. So that, that was really cool to see. That was like a huge, huge moment for us. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about your growth, uh, the growth of your team. How have you been managing that growth? How have you been hiring the people? And how do you work? I mean, what's your, you know, the, the kind of organizations that you mm -hmm. like to implement? So when we, uh, we actually started hiring more when, um, 
after the lockdown. So we were like 30, 30 something, you know, beginning of this year. Then we had to hire more people on the care, care team because we had this huge load of inbound for, you know, customer service because, you know, you see there was this wave going on. So we had to hire more. But apart from that, it was pretty much the same thing. And then when we realized momentum was still going on and before hitting the gas on hiring, we knew that we didn't have the managers in place. So I think the first step was to put the right foundation and say, okay, we are missing that person, that person, that person in terms of middle management, because otherwise I'm going to be managing 20 people, which is definitely not something you should do. So we really staffed the entire middle management brick. And once we had that, then we started here hitting the gas. And the first step to hit the gas was actually to hire a talent acquisition manager. Because obviously, if I had to do it, it would be 25% of my time. And I would not do as good as someone who is professional and actually has this job, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a huge game changer when our talent acquisition manager actually uh, came uh, at Livestorm and put all those great processes in place, really like rational rationalize everything and now we actually have like 10 new hires every single month i think it's paul it's just because of that and and then once we have that it's all about uh preserving culture and structuring correctly making sure that no one gets more than five people to manage and that all the contracts and benefits and whatever admin thing going on is really well structured really well clear for everyone and also you know the salaries grades all the admin thing needs to be really structured hence why we just hired a um, head of people right after the talent acquisition manager so i think all in all the foundation and everything is have the right uh, managers and right process builder in place before you hit the gas otherwise it it goes to shit Mm -hmm. And are you working all remotely? Yes. Uh, so pre pre twenty twenty, we already had fifty um, ish percent of the company working remote, and now it's closer to seventy five eighty percent. Obviously, when we are going to reopen the office, if we do reopen the office, we'll have probably ten ish people within HQ. Otherwise, everyone else is remote. Mm. Okay, cool. So let, let's talk a little bit about how do you keep everybody on the same page uh, in terms of culture when you grow so rapidly? You said 10 people every month. Well, you know, I think the first thing is um, when there is a new, I think for the for the people that have been there for a while, you know, that are actually hiring on their team. So for example, for us, it's head of growth, my co-founders. I, I don't need to be part of that. They they are really they have absorbed the culture, so they actually unconsciously know what they sh we should be looking for, and I, I trust them like hundred percent. But if this is a new team, if this is a new manager or someone that just became manager, then I'll I, I stay really actively part of the hiring process at some point to make sure that I still have an input on yeah this is a good fit or this is not a good fit. So I think that's the first thing that we've done. That we've done. Um, also, we really put on paper on uh, document. Document is really the basis of everything. Document what you're looking for, and you know, build the um, the questionnaire, build the um, the evaluation framework. And once you have that, you know, the the rest just follows up. But that's pretty much the foundation of everything. And during the onboarding phase, uh, we basically have, you know the same structure as we had before so we 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 make sure and i think yob just actually mentioned that before actually is meeting as much people as possible make it as dense as possible to make sure people have all the connections they need and from a personal standpoint they can reach out and get to know the team as if they had to know the whole team but also because they need to understand the business as a whole and just keep that mindset check of all trades mindset that we look for so I think, yeah, job interventions about that was exactly what actually what, what I would recommend. Mm. Do you still, like, in the recruitment process, do you, uh, is there a moment when you meet uh, the, the applicants uh, before the final decision? Yes, usually I always part of that, uh, unless this is something run by one of my co-founders or run by someone who's been there since, you know, like at least two years. But otherwise, I'm always there. 
I, I usually on the final steps. Uh, and yeah, that that does it usually. It's it's more it's enough. Mm -hmm. So if you had to, I love to to go back to the values. If you had to give me the main values, I know it's a hard exercise, and mm -hmm. you said in the beginning uh, it's not obvious all the time, but you made the exercise. So what are the main values for you? Not bullshit values, like the real core values. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. I, I'm really hesitating between two, but I, you know, I, I was hesitating between being being resourceful, being no, not being resourceful, being curious about the business, about the other teams, and beyond, beyond, you know, go beyond the scope of the job. But then I would just say, well, I'm removing ego, I'm removing humility from from the equation. So I would rather go with humility. I, I would rather have someone I can coach, I can teach other part of the companies and bring them there and that person has no ego and is coachable rather than someone who is a diva and doesn't want to 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 be coached in that in that way so i think humility is something that that will i would preserve and you know everyone on the team has this really simple way of being and that's that's really refreshing you know especially on the tech world to be mm. honest Mm. And you, you personally, personally as a CEO, um, do you uh, often use videos to talk to everybody? I mean, pre-recorded videos or things like that. I'm just curious. That's a that's a good point. We actually started thinking about it. I I'm not really comfortable. I'm comfortable on the live video. Oddly enough, not so much comfortable on its synchronous video. I'm when I'm staring to myself and talking, it feels like really weird, but. You know, more and more we are using actually synchronous video, but not on my team, not myself. Actually, uh, my co-founders are doing that for teaching the team about products, about certain part of the certain part of the business. But I feel I should do it more. But yeah, but video I do it every single week. I have these team meetings where I jump on stage yeah. and talk about the business. So live live video is something I'm really comfortable with. But I think in synchronous video as 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 a good point. Typically, I think um, I heard uh, I don't know who's the CEO anymore, but anyway, they actually do uh, during their onboarding phases. As soon as they get a lot of question in one specific area, so let's say I don't know uh, stocks, for example, and how stocks works. So based specifically in French. They actually put together a uh, video, a synchronous video, to really explain in detail. So you know, it's a thirty-minute long video, but it explains in details. And so all the questions about that, and that's a lot of times gain actually. So if I were to do something asynchronous, it will be to answer some kind of a FAQ, like you know, to answer those questions. Very interesting. It's crazy how these times make us uh, uh, reach to a limit in a way. We're not actors, right? So recording mm -hmm. videos, a video can feel pretty weird and I can totally understand. And in the meantime, we've been all using tools like yours and we see ourselves, we see our face all day. We, we were not yeah. used to, to have this mirror all the time. Uh, <laughs> and at the same yeah. time, the, the thing that is interesting is people are starting to feel to be more uh, understanding, you know, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's okay to have a background when you have a Christmas tree in a, a speaking of Christmas tree, because actually I do have a Christmas tree at home, you know, and whenever I have a meeting, people say, oh, you have a Christmas tree. Yes, I do have a Christmas tree. And that's all right. You know, it's okay to, to not wear makeup or whatever. Or because you know it's just stupid. You're you're yourself. You live in a house like everyone else, and <laughs> and that's all right. You know people are, are being more understanding, and they start to realize that what is important actually the thing that you're saying, not how you look. And I think that's actually a step forward, if you ask me. Totally, I see what you mean. The tolerance. We're more yes. tolerant. We see we see our colleagues are humans as well. We Absolutely. see the interior. All right. Uh, there is a question. How do you make sure new team members hire remotely feel integrated in the team? So there is a lot of, it's a combination of all the small things. I don't think there is like one big rock to push. It's a lot of small rocks that make you go, go on the right path. For example, for us is taking the time to present yourself on Slack and we make sure that is actually on Slack and not on video or whatever, because sometimes you don't know the person can be shy or it's it's really a tough exercise and we don't want to impose that. So we make it on Slack, take the time to write some cool text. And usually people 
we ask people to react to 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 bounce back on that and create a conversation, ignition something, create some bounds like this. Uh, also, uh, as I said, a lot of meetings on the first two weeks to make sure they meet as much people as possible. Um, second thing, uh, third thing will be to participate in all the small. We have this. Uh, we have this room, you no know, lifetime. We can actually create evergreen rooms with one link, and then you can join and you jump on stage, and that's it. And we have this room specifically dedicated to coffee shops, uh, coffee breaks. I mean, you have the other one that is specifically dedicated to games, and a third specifically dedicated to you know uh, apéro drinks, whatever on the, on the Friday night. So. We try to push those as much as possible whenever there is someone new to you know participate to a drink party or to a you know Among Us game or whatever, so they can actually have conversations with them, you know, outside of the uh, professional kind of uh, context. So that's one of the things. And also, for example, when people fill out the thing, the onboarding form, we try to ask as many not personal details, but the things they like. So typically conversation starter. So what food they like, what Hogwarts house they belong to, for example, for the Harry Potter fan, that kind of small stuff, you know, that yeah, creates a uh, relief on the people. If the, if you know. mm -hmm. Totally, totally, I get it. And um, uh, right now, are you uh, um, looking for uh, sales people or more product people, uh, engineers? What kind of people are you looking for? I'm looking for all kind of people. I'm kind of people. We have about more than a hundred positions over uh, open, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty much all, all, all the mostly sales, mostly care, and. I was going to say mostly engineers, so basically all the positions. But yeah, those are the three main teams that we're looking for. All right. For international remote hires, what approach do you recommend? Freelance, opening entity, any other? That's a really good question. And that's really good timing to ask that question. Um, so the way we went, well, we went with, so for the US teams, for the people outside of France, at least, so outside of not French and outside of France is going with a freelance contract. So it doesn't mean, I mean, for a long time, it, it, it bothered me because, you know, fundamentally it is a freelance contract, but we try to mimic as possible, as much as possible, whatever benefits they, they can have from a, a French contract. So it goes with all the benefits you can, you, you can imagine we want to provide them for them. It could be gears, it could be hardware, it could be, um, supplement in terms of salary to access a healthcare, all that stuff we want to provide them. And also it doesn't matter where you live, you can live in Mauritius, you can live in San Francisco, you can live in Paris, you're gonna get the same thing based on, uh, it doesn't matter where you live. So that's another thing. And so freelance contracts is what we went for. This is still what we have today. Um, I think the next step for us will be to probably have entities um, as soon as we have a certain threshold of people. You know, and, and other steps in the middle will have also this, uh, I don't know how you call that in French, uh, portage, in English actually, portage. Uh, anyway, so, you know, moving, there is, yeah. you know, you have a third party doing the contracts for you for yeah. another threshold. So progressively move to an entity, have a ladder, as mm. soon as you get more people and more people. Otherwise, you know, from an admin standpoint, it could be, there could be a risk. Um, I think one thing that I can recommend for you guys, if you're interested in hiring remotes, there is this amazing company called Deal, so D E E L, and no, they actually, I like oh, you know them, yeah. Okay, so that's it. they handle contracts, freelance contract, and also portage, and uh, it's pretty cool. Exactly, exactly. Alex Boazis, who is the CEO of Deal, will be. Uh, uh, talking, uh, uh, I think it's not the next one, but uh, later on, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, actually, it's the next one. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a perfect transition. Wow, look at that. <laughs> it was a pleasure, Gilles. Thank you sure. very much. I think okay. we've learned a lot. Um, thank you. Thank you a lot. And um, we'll... Um, I wish you the best for uh, hiring amazing people at Lifestone. Right. See Have you. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye-bye.